Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. I'm proud to have joining us Andrews Osborne Academy's new head coach, Eli Gore. Now, Eli is coming over there from South Kent, where he uh, was coaching under Coach Rafael Chilius for three years. Before that, he was at UConn, the Portland Trail Blazers, Texas Corpus Christi, Texas A&M Corpus Christi, um, Georgetown Prep, and then he played the JUCO level, the D3 level, Coach D3. So we talk about all these differences between JUCO, D3, low major, high major, MBA, high-level prep school like South Kent, and kind of what he's bringing to Andrews Osborne. His father-in-law is also the head coach at MIT. So we talk about weighted and unweighted GPAs and, and some more fun stuff. But great episode with Coach Eli Gore where he definitely gets into differences between levels and going to the right fit, which we say over and over again on this podcast. So thank you for uh, joining us today. Hope you enjoy the podcast. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yeah, somebody wants me. Eli, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Now, it is uh, middle of August 2023 while we're talking, and you just got the job a few months ago at yep. Andrews Osborne in Northeast Ohio, Andrews Osborne Academy. And we've yep. actually already connected on three players already. So tell me a little bit about why you took this job, and then give me your elevator pitch on you know why a kid should come play for you at Andrews Osborne. Yeah, um, for me, it was a, you know a, a great opportunity um, to grow as a leader and be a part of an institution that is looking to grow. Um, we definitely need sports engagement here. And so it's been something that I, I, I'm putting in as a challenge to really put our name out there for the sports world, like specifically basketball. Um, and it's an opportunity for me to build something um, and do it the way I want to do it. And obviously that aligns with the school. So that's the first thing, um, just looking for the challenge um, to have a national brand. The next thing I think like that would make a student want to come here is because for one, you're going to be loved on in the classroom, outside the classroom through me. Like I always think you should choose um, any school or any program for the coach. And I know that I'm going to give a level of care um, and a level of attention to detail with your journey, with those students' journeys. And so that's the next thing, like you wanna choose that. The next thing is we're in a great area compared to other boarding prep schools. We're not in the middle of nowhere. Um, we're in a, a thriving area. The next thing too, like, you know, Cleveland gets a bad perception. Cleveland is a great city. Um, we're 20 minutes from downtown Cleveland. So you could take a bus here, get to a game. I went to a Guardians game already. It's funny. I was at the game uh, where Tim Anderson and, and Ramirez got into that little scuffle. Um, but the, the the Cleveland sports energy here is like, it's hard to match that. Like they love their teams. And so hopefully one day, you know, Andrew Osborne is one of those teams that the city holds high and they, you know, want to support. So that's, that's the main thing. I think Cleveland is a great, beautiful city that a lot of people are sleeping on. So talk to me about this. I know I've had this conversation with the guys at Kiskey and the guys at Western Reserve. New England, with all those coach or all those schools clustered together, make it easy for coaches to, you know, college coaches to make their rounds. What do you tell families when they ask you about exposure to college coaches in your neck of the woods outside of Cleveland versus the cluster in New England? Yeah, you know, that, that's the strength to them. Um, <coughs> there's a lot of schools in this area as well. Um, maybe not necessarily in terms of like the Ivies, right? But, you know, Case Western is not far. Kenyon College is not far. Um, New York, you know, it's, you know, Rochester, Buffalo, um, Hobart, those type of schools, like they're not far. They're three hours away. Um, but in general, you know, when you choose boarding school, you're, you, you're trying to recruit it nationally anyway. So yeah. you want to go someplace for one, like for the Midwestern families, right? And the families that are from the Southern, like the central Southern area, um, this is closer for you and you're still trying to be recruited nationally. And so if you want to be able to visit, 
your son on a you know a frequent basis, if you want him to be able to come home, if you want to not necessarily let go of that athletic journey you want to go on with them, like choose this a place like this because we're still going to have access to everything that those New England schools will have. Um, and and I, I spent time in New England, as you know. So, you know, I think personally, when we're talking about the kids who are going to go high D3, I don't necessarily think you need to be in New England for that. Um, and then when we talk about the kids who are being, you know, high level division one, the coaches are going to come to you. Um, and there's a ton of programs outside of New England that are thriving. Um, maybe not boarding schools, but there's a ton of, you know, as we know, like these academies and these different schools that are thriving. So I don't think, I think you make the choice based on like what feels the most comfortable with you. We had one family that chose us over a New England school um, simply because he lives in Rochester. And this is a three hour drive versus him going all the way to nine, six hours away. And they just did not feel comfortable doing that with their son. And I think the same thing will occur with students who are on the East Coast. You know, you may not feel as comfortable coming to the Midwest as you would going to New England. But at the end of the day, you choose it for the coach and you also like you choose what's most comfortable for you. But recruitment should not you should not feel like you can't get recruited if you come to the Midwest. I think that is something that is just I don't really understand where you would go with that, because, like I said, you're going to a boarding school. You want to be recruited nationally anyway. You don't want to just be recruited in your region. Yeah, and if you look, like yesterday I was looking at MIT's roster for something we'll get into here in the near future. Those kids are from all over the place. There's some boarding schools, there's private schools, there's public schools. So even though I'm a mouthpiece, you're a mouthpiece for the benefits of the prep school world, it is not the end-all, be-all. And I'm sure you've gotten this before, especially at South Kent, but families try to shop prep schools like, hey, which prep school is going to give me the best chance to play at Harvard? Well, yeah. if Harvard wants you and you can qualify academically, Tommy Amaker is going to take you, whether you're at a top end New England prep school or some podunk place in Montana. He he really, obviously, all the benefits that come from prep school, he's going to like that in a player and a student. But look at these rosters, right? Even Kentucky, even Duke, they've got guys on their team from public schools, right? Yes. So that's why what you said earlier, picking a prep school based on the coach and the experience you want. Yes, if you're good enough, you're going to get found. And coaches like you... Say a kid wants to look at MIT or Caltech or Montana State, you can pick up the phone and call any of these guys on their behalf. 100%. It's funny you said that. And like uh, this is like a little plug to my family. You know, my father-in-law is the head coach at MIT. Right. So I know that exactly. Like he, I always ask him that question, like, hey, what school do you have a lot of success at? And he says, it doesn't matter. Like it could be a kid at a small school in Kentucky. If they can get into MIT, they can get in MIT. Just because you go to Brewster or Exeter or now nah, I shouldn't say names. Just because you go to a school does not give you a better chance to get into a school like MIT or a school like Harvard. You have to earn your spot there. And their recruit, they have budgets to recruit all over internationally yeah. as well. So yeah, you make the choice on what is going to be best for your development. I think that's the most important thing. So like, yes, just me having that firsthand experience with my father-in-law, like I have those questions. What school is the best school for you to recruit from? He doesn't have that answer because it changes every single year for him. Well, MIT makes it easy too. Like you have to have what, probably a 33 or above minimum. So there's only a small pool he's going to recruit from anyway, right? Or is it, is it higher than that? It's higher than that. It's okay. not... You and you're talking, you're just talking a different ball game. Like it for them, like you know, and one of his goals I can speak upon is he wants a team full of 4.0 students. And when we say 4.0, unweighted. A lot of things too for families to know that when you tell colleges you have a 4.0, well, the first thing he's gonna they're gonna ask most of the time for the higher academics is that weighted. Because if you're telling me you have a 4.0, but you have five or six Bs, well, you're not a real 4.0, and it may slow your recruitment down. And you just and just being aware of those things. So, like, yeah, like, it's not a lot of things that they can do to budge. But there's a lot of great schools and opportunities that accept high academic students. And, and for those that don't know, explain weighted versus unweighted GPAs, Eli. So weighted, you know, like you have your honors courses and your AP courses. If you are trying to go to a school like MIT or, you know, Emory or, you know, some of these higher level institutions, um, you want to have 
a 4.0 unweighted, meaning there's no honor extra credit, there's no AP extra credit, your score is an A. And a lot of kids slip, they don't realize that, and they market themselves as a 4.0, and then they get later in the process, and they found out, you know, they find out that you don't really have a 4.0. You have a 3.5 because you had four or five Bs. Now, you still are going to go to a great school, but you kind of wasted time marketing yourself as a 4.0. And then the next thing, once you're at that stage, it's not over. You can still get into some of these places, but you're going to have to make up with the test score. Or So like I can speak on Caltech. Caltech is, is, is blind right now. They're not taking tests. So he can tell you directly, and he he's he's really good at just telling you, you're not going to get in because if you don't have a 4.0 on weighted, there's nine to there's many many students who do, and I have to like our admissions team is not going to budge on that, and so that kind of like plays a big factor in some families I just know that I've been talking to they they're not really aware that you have to have a unweighted 4.0 for some of these institutions. So when kid, let me ask, I'm asking this selfishly for myself. When a kid reaches out to prep schools or college coaches, they should always use unweighted. Always. I feel like that's the best way. Okay. Uh, just because you don't want to un, you know, market yourself the wrong way. Like you wanna, you want it to be clean. This is where I'm at. So you, you know, because as you know, this is about college placement. And the sooner we know, the better we, off we are. Like it's no point of us wasting time in something that is going to be a big reach versus like not taking hard looks at the places that are attainable. And that, and that to me, I think is like, you know, that's what recruitment is. You, you need to know what, like I always ask every family, what's your goal is if, if it's going to be low major, are you going to choose a low major? Cause you want to go division one. Are you going for the best school? When you know that clear answer now, when it becomes a battle between a low major school, you know, one bid league conference, or are you going to a school like Amherst, or you going to a school like Tufts. We know that late in the ball game, which school you're probably going to choose. And so I think that's extremely important to have that clarity. Because as you know, like, as we'll talk about more, but like the experiences is what you really want to pay for. Yeah. You don't want to, you don't want to chase something. I've worked at low major. I've worked at so many different levels and there's pros and cons to everything. And a lot of things is just the lack of knowledge. It's, it's kind of like that Cinderella effect. You watch the tournament, you watch the March madness and you see that small school and you think that their experience was so rosy, but you have no clue versus if you went to a UAA school your experience might fit closer to the high major schools that you're interested in or that you dream to be at, but you just, you just don't know. So yeah. that that's important. Well, let's start back to your beginning. Well, real quick before last thing, where does, when does a weighted GPA, when is that advantageous to share that or what's it even matter? The weighted GPA. Ah, oh, man, you know, that's interesting. I think it, you know, I don't want to speak on schools. I don't want to say schools, but I think when you're, when you're, when you're going to a state institution, I think it helps. Like when you, like, so, you know, you said, I, st I started at Salisbury. I don't think it hurts at a Salisbury. Um, when you're trying to fight different students in your state, but when you get to these national brands and it's very, very competitive, I think it's a waste of time. Okay. So I think in some ways, it, it, I don't think that, honestly, I just think you should just stick with the unweighted personally. I don't think just thinking because if you get a B, we know. Like if you get a B, that's a three. You got a B. Whether or not the class is weighted because you're in an honors course, because the thing that's what gets tricky, honors and AP are not the same thing. Right? Like, right, right. So what is the real purpose of telling me that you got a, a B in an honors course when I know that the AP course is going to be more valuable? So I just, I, I personally just feel like you should stay unweighted, but at the same time, I do know in some state institutions, like it helps. Okay. Good to know. I learned a little bit today too. So thanks for that. Uh, 
you went to high school in the DC area. And then from high school, you went to junior college first. Yep. Talk to me about that process when you're, when it's senior year and you're trying to figure out what's going on next. Why did you choose that route? What were maybe some of your other options? Um, a little bit of delusion on my half, um, as every kid. And that's why I really like love what I do. Um, but you know, I grew up and I, my experience is that I played in the DMV area during the time of Kevin Durant and Mike Beasley and Chris Matthews, lethal shooter. I went to National Christian Academy with all those guys. And so at a young age, I was able to compete with them. Now, maybe my growth as a player kind of went stagnant, but I wasn't able to see that. So when it got to the recruiting process, I kind of had a little bit of delusion. You know, I played with such and such, so I feel like I should be able to play at a big name school. So I kind of missed on a lot of opportunities in that part. Um, I was, I went to the Bullis School, um, which was a really great academic institution, beautiful campus, unbelievable, sharp difference from the school that I was at at National Christian Academy. And when I went there, I had a lot of high academic opportunities, but like I said, my delusion kind of like, I didn't know. I didn't know what I didn't know. And so like Harvard was interested. A lot of Ivy League schools were interested. You know, some Morehouse Division II school was interested, which is a really good academic school. Um, I didn't take advantage of those things. So, but it got to my senior year. Um, it was a little late. There were some Patriots that were still interested. I needed like 50 more points on my SAT. I didn't take advantage of that either. I took it one time. Um, so that was one thing. And then got late and is the choice of going to prep school. We're going to junior college. My family could not afford prep school. Um, and I was not one of those kids that, you know, would receive a scholarship to go to prep school. I just wasn't. So I went the junior college route um, with the dreams of still playing high major, high division one basketball. And so that's where I got to junior college. And while I'm in junior college, my best friend was recruited to go to Harvard. And we're calling each other every night. And his experience versus my experience is like, sharp difference so while I was in your junior college my brain kind of like went from do I really want to play on scholarship or do because I, I don't think the NBA is in reach you know I can keep fighting you know and that's nothing wrong with that like keeping the hope alive but just kind of had a realistic moment where you know like my family my, at the time my family was separated you know my mom and pops were separated I felt a burden that I needed to to start thinking about the next stage of life and so to me, at that point, is that like, I want to go to a school that I feel like when I get a degree here, I'm going to have support to help me find a job. And so that was the that was the biggest thing on my mind in junior college, finding a school that when I graduate here, I'll be able to get a job right away and start making some money. And so that's what led me to leave the scholarship route. And I chose Division three school, Salisbury University, Josh Merkel, who's now at Randolph Macon College. He's had a lot of success there. It was his first year and the rest was history. I just, I went with it. I remember I came on his visit. And the first thing that I want to say, I visited several division two schools. Fairmont state was amazing. Um, and some others I'm not going to name, like I don't want to put them down, but they weren't amazing. When I went to Salisbury right away, I felt like I was in a division one level campus, like the facilities, the location, just the, the people who work there is a teacher's college. So it put a heavy emphasis on the teachers and their relationship with the students. And so I just felt right away, like, okay, like this is a good spot. I'm going to grow. I'm going to learn. And, you know, like my experience there was like unbelievable. I love Salisbury. It's very dear to my heart. So that that's many kind of what happened with the junior college situation. Like junior college is a lot like last chance you, what you see. You know, I was Division One junior college, so everything was paid for. But still, when we went on those long eight-hour trips, we getting bag lunches. You know, we getting like bologna, and like, you know, it's a it's a it's a miracle if we stop for McDonald's. You know, and when a break is coming, like we got to move out the dorms, and our dorms were good. We had to move out the dorms and go stay with people, and it was not as rosy as what you would think a scholarship level. Um, experience would be. What's something about JUCO level that you experienced that people might not know? High level. You're going to play against really good players 
on a night in and night basis. Um, but because it's a very like two years and you're done, you're not going to experience the level of culture that you think um, that you would in a four year. That's something, man, that when I finished at Salisbury and I only spent four years at Salisbury because I became a grad assistant and I stayed. So I basically spent a full college experience there. But when after the first two years, I was really like jealous of the ones who were able to be from Salisbury from freshman year to their senior year. And in junior college, you don't get that experience because you have a teammate for one year and that teammate will be gone. And then you'll have another teammate for the next year and then you're on your way. And so you don't really get that type of like community, that that culture. You don't get that level um, at a junior college. Junior college is more, I think you get a lot of survivors, a lot of people scratching and calling to to keep their career and, and their dreams alive. So I think that's like the difference between the four-year model. And like, if I could go back and do it all over again, I probably would go to division three school or division two school um, and just spend the whole four years there. Yeah. Hindsight. Very Hindsight. Uh, helpful, isn't it? Yep. Yep. All right. Uh, you know, you coached at Salisbury, then you jumped up um, after a year at Georgetown Prep and did uh, Texas A&M Corpus Christi. So you went to the low major level in D1. What did you notice between the D3 level of Salisbury versus the low major level? Like kids all want to go D1 and there are D1, obviously Corpus Christi had success last year, but there are D1s that are in the bottom 50 of the RPI rankings that have no tradition, no education, no alumni support, no one goes to games. It's D1, but it's just not that great. Not saying this school is that, but just walk me through the difference between low major D1 versus, you know, high level D3 like Salisbury. So I could speak on corporates because I have very fond memories of it, but I can definitely tell you the differences. Um, when I'm at Salisbury, we won our first conference championship. But even prior to that, we had a lot of people at our games. Um, that's not every Division three. So, but but at, at Salisbury, we had a lot of people at our games. We were an attraction in the community there, in that that small city in the Eastern Shore. Um, so that's the first thing. Like it felt like our games were a big deal. We had a lot of people there. Um, in terms of like our presence in the community, we had a lot of like engagement with the public school system. Um, you get jobs right off campus, you know, you you really start to feel like you're a member of Salisbury when you're there. At Corpus Christi, there was a disconnect in terms of like, we were really good, but it was hard to get people to our games. Um, and so that was the first thing. Like, so our games weren't necessarily like the most exciting because we went on a great win streak, but we didn't have people there. In terms of like what I saw, what was happening, Division three schools prepare you for life. Um, I got to go pick my classes. You know, I got to probably get a job. I don't have to get a job. Never one has to, but you know, I got a job so I can have my own spending money, you know? Mm -hmm. So now I have to balance class and I have to balance work. Um, and just also taking accountability on what I'm taking. When I was in, when I was at Corpus Christi, the kids really didn't have a lot of say in what they took. It was just about getting them to graduation. So if I have one student and it's looking like he wants to do business, but that business class isn't necessarily ideal for our, our athletic schedule. Mm. So now we can probably move him to communications because we want him to graduate on time and we want him to have a, a schedule that makes sense with the athletics. But to me, like, that's like a drawback. Like why? Cause even if I graduate from Corpus Christi, it's in the A&M system, but we both know like, it's not quite right to the tier that you want. And so that's the one thing that I would say, like, it's a difference. So the kids are kind of pampered in one way. Um, and then when you're at a division three school and the culture is great, you learn how to work on your game individually because the rules are set in place where the coach can't work with you year round. But what does that do? Now you have a group of kids who are taking ownership of their development and they're taking ownership of their culture. And right. yeah, the head coach is aware of it and he's definitely overseeing it, but he's not there on a day to day. He takes a CEO route. He's up top. He's making sure everybody's doing what they're supposed to do on the campus 
But then the leaders on that team are the ones who are really driving it home. They're acting like a director. They are in charge of the freshmen, the sophomores, the the, le- the senior leaders. They're all in one unison and they're working. And it, it's more realistic to what it feels like when you work in the workforce versus when I was in Division One. I, I just feel like it was very like labor. You're, you're a labor, you know, like it's more a professional model. I'm going to tell you what to do, when you're going to do it, when I tell you to do it, how this is how you do it. You don't have a lot of say or freedom. You don't have to take ownership. It's really do what I say. And so like it, it, there's drawbacks to both, but I just know like for me in the workforce, my my division three experience made me prepare for the next step. And let me ask you this though. That's great. That's great context there and those differences. But what about on the court? The D3 Salisbury team players versus the D1 Corpus Christi players. What difference did you see physically? Size and athleticism. That's pretty much size, it then when it comes down to it, right? Size and athleticism. In terms of playing style, like the one thing that I knew for me, I'm a weird, you know, I'm a I'm a strong guy, right? And I was pretty athletic. But mentally, I wasn't ready to play at that stage. But when I got older, I was definitely ready. Like I couldn't fit with them athletically. Um, but in terms of like, I think in some levels, the difference between a kid going division three and a kid going division one, and some kids need to take this and hear this like the right way, not the wrong way. There's a difference in height. I'm a six, four guy and I'm really effective, but I'm probably going to take the six, eight guy because I have, because on a nightly basis, the six, eight guy has, he doesn't have to work as hard as the six, four guy. And so mm-hmm. there's anomalies. There's guys who are six four and they're, you know, they're phenomenal. Don't, you know, don't, don't misquote me, but I think that's the biggest difference. Like there's a five nine point guard who's really good and dynamic, but there's a six two point guard who's maybe not as dynamic, but is a safer bet. And I think that happens a lot of times with the differences in that level. Now, when we're talking high major, it's definitely different. Division three from high major is a big difference, but from the low major level, it's not sometimes just a difference in size. Um, sometimes, in some ways, one more thing. You have a defined playing style. You have a defined role. And a lot of good basketball players, especially at the Division three level, are tweeners. They don't have a defined role. They're between a two and a three. And we can't say you're a shooting guard or we can't say you're a small forward. Sometimes height is a re- reason for that. But you get what I'm saying? Like, you're a combo guard. Well, at the Division One level, I know this guy is a point guard, and I can trust that he can play that position, right? And so sometimes the and, and basketball is evolving and changing, but back then that that was one of the things that I saw. Like the guy who's a point guard, like he's a comfortable point guard. Versus when we go play a Division Two school, that guy across from us might be just as talented, but he doesn't have a defined role. So there's, these are the little things that kind of separate you sometimes. Well, now talking about separation, your next job is bumping up the high major at UConn. So tell me about that difference from high major UConn to low major. Is it size and athleticism again? Is that the big defining mark? Yeah. Now you're going to like a, a different percentile of athlete. So yes, for sure. Those athletes like our, you know, our biggest guy at Corpus Christi was six foot seven. And he was like 240. And he's playing overseas now. He's making a lot of money. He's a, he was a borderline NBA prospect. He spent some time in the G League. Um, but when we got to when I got to UConn, like, you know, that's a normal. Like, like yeah. the the six seven kid who's two forty is a a normal. He's average. And then your guards, you know, we had Al Tariq Gilbert. He was five foot nine, but Al Tariq Gilbert had like a 50, 40 inch vertical could shoot it, could stop on a dime, and was very savvy, like was a really smart player. So the guards at that level are unique. Jaden Adams, NBA player, if you night in and night out, just as good as NBA, anybody in the NBA, extremely talented. Um, Christian Vital, he was another guy who just his competitiveness, like Christian's skill set compared to the others, wasn't there as a freshman, but his comp- he was psychotic in terms of how he approached the game and how he approached getting better. And it, it, it caught up, you know, his, his game caught up with his level of confidence. So like those guys, 
when I think about a division three guard, like all of them are playing above the rim. All of them are elite athletes or like in that same year was Ty Jerome. Ty Jerome is not the most athletic, but he's still six foot five and he's big and he's strong and he knows his game is moving at a different pace. And it's hard to explain that to some kids, but like we know, like you don't have to be the most athletic, but you have to make quick decisions. You have to be able to process things at a very fast rate at that level. And so that is the difference between some kids and a high major kid. Like either I'm super athletic or I'm just processing this game way faster than everybody else is on the floor to me. And that's how Luca's who he is. Luca Doncic, like he ain't the fastest guy, but he his game, you know, his mind is working quicker. And so um, those are one of the things that I definitely noticed, like athleticism right away. Like everyone's way more athletic size. Everyone's bigger, stronger, and faster. And then, you know, for the guards, like they're processing the game just at a higher rate than, than the counterparts at the lower schools or, you know, division threes. And then you said that the guys lower, lower level of Corpus Christi were more pampered in the D3 levels. Obviously talk to me about the differences between just like everything you got at Corpus Christi, right. As far as like gear, travel, maybe classes, and now translate that to, you know, UConn, like what's the, the experience of the player? How are those differences between those two levels? Yeah. So when you're at UConn, that's one of the blue blood. So mm-hmm. giving them all the credit for what they've done, you are a, a star in your own right. You're the biggest attraction in Connecticut. That's one thing about going to UConn, you know, there's no pro teams there. So you are a pro team. Um, so your experience is definitely different. You're definitely going to be more pampered than even Corpus Christi, but rightfully so in a lot of ways. So like, you know, we're flying private, you know, we have the training mills. But with all that said, like you're the people who are leading you are, you know, no, no disrespect, but, you know, they're experts in their field, too. Like our our strength coach at the time at, at uh, UConn, Ed, he he works for the Lakers now. He's the head strength coach for the Lakers. And so that's the person working with you. And he had he came from the NBA to work at UConn. So you're just dealing with a different talent pool too all around. But with that said, like, yes, like everything is higher scale. Like it's just the amount of gear you get, you know, um, the amount of attention you get. You're playing on TV, you're flying private. It's just a total different experience. Like when I was at Corpus, we we took one flight, I think two flights, maybe two flights. When I was at UConn, we flew everywhere. Mm-hmm. We even flew to Philadelphia, which was probably like a six hour drive, but we flew to Philly, you know? And so it's a definite different experience in terms of that. But, you know, they've earned that. I, I will say that like they're a blue blood. They've earned that experience. Um, and I don't know if every school in at the time we were in the American conference, I don't know if every school had that experience. Right. But, so that's another thing, you know, like it, within your conference, I don't know if every school is having the same experience, but UConn's one of those special schools where you get that experience. Yeah. Now these parents that you're now talking to, trying to get them to come to Andrews Osborne, about every kid I talk to wants to play D1, right? So when that family comes to you and says, Hey, we want to come here and our goal is to play at the D1 level, what is your response to that? I keep it honest and, and you know, I tell them my goal is to make sure you play college basketball and that you're ready to play college basketball. Because I've seen so many different levels, I, I truly feel like you make this investment to make sure you go to the best school that has the best experience. Don't just chase something that is arbitrary, Division One, because mm-hmm. you can go to a Division One and that experience not be good at all. And or and I, I really stress that. I really, the same way I say when you choose a, a boarding school, choose it for the experience that you're going to have with that coach and what you're going to get from it, not because we're playing in the nicest league or we have the best schedule. And so the same thing with when it comes to, I want to play division one. Well, okay. There's a lot of division ones, but if there's a school that comes in the way that is a great academic situation and your life will be set, like, you know, you graduate from this school and you, you meet the right people, you're going to be on the right track. Like take a hard look at that. 
Um, so that's the first thing I say. I'm preparing you for college basketball. I'm not preparing you for a specific level because you can go to Division three. These same kids that tell you, you know, these same kids that tell you I want to play Division one, they go to Division three and they don't play. Mm -hmm. They're not ready to play on the on the Division three team. So what went wrong? You were good. You thought you were good enough to go to Division Division one, but you now you end up at Division three and you're not playing as a freshman. So the goal is for one that you go someplace and you're ready to play. That's the first goal. And then the next goal is like, we're going to go where you earn. We're going to go where they want you. <laughs> we want you. We don't want to be chasing. We want them to want you. It's a, we, we all know in life, it's a different experience when someone wants you versus when you chase them. And so that was like things that I, I definitely try to put in their head early, making sure they're, they're aware of those things. Right. And I talked to him all the time. I was a D1 or bus kid and I share my experience. I've said it plenty of times on this podcast, but um, was it the right move? I don't know, but I chased that D1 bug just like you did. And um, it's all about right fit. But, you know, you can't say that to a 17, 18 year old. They're just not going to hear it if they're hell bent on that March Madness dream we talked about earlier. So, and I'm all for that because kids do come into prep school, sometimes nice. reclassing, sometimes a post grad with nothing but D3s and they get scholarships every year it happens to my clients, right? So yes. that dream is there. I don't want ever to shoot it down, right? Anyone's dreams, but let's talk about right fit at the end of the day. I had a kid a couple of years ago and uh, he had four offers, one D2 and three D1s. The three D1s whose name I'm not going to mention were like I said earlier, bottom 50 RPI ratings, not great academics, no history. Coach is always in the hot seat. No one comes to your games or a D2 that's high academic, top 20 in the country, a major U.S. city. Like that's where D2 makes sense, right? That's where right fit comes in. So conversations you and I have on on almost a, a weekly basis with people, but it, it just bears repeating over and over again, right fit, not just for prep school, also for college. And based on that, you know, we're talking D1 here and you, you have worked with a lot of players that have gone D1 and a majority of the players out there are guards. What does it take? for a guard to play D1? Yeah, you got to have a defined identity. I think the sooner you know your strengths and weaknesses. And so that kind of goes back to like, when I do meet with fans and I just want to reiterate this, like I'm not shooting their green <laughs> now, but I want to give them, I don't want to oversell them. Like if don't make this decision because I'm saying you can go D1 from here. I just think that's not, a, that's not a great way to be because not everyone can go division one. The next thing is like, Having a defined playing style, one of the things I meet with every family and I, I go through a presentation and I talk to them about like, what is it going to look like when you're playing for me? And the goal is that when you finish playing for me, you have a strong idea of who you are on the basketball floor. Like not, not your position, but your strengths and weaknesses and how you impact winning. So for a guard, can you shoot? Are you a high level shooter? Are you a high level defender? Are these things that you can hang your hat on that you can do on a nightly basis consistently? So smaller guards. Yeah. Everybody tells you guard 94 feet. Yeah. You probably need to be able to do that. If you're under six feet, you need to be able to impact the game that way. Um, scoring like shooting. Are you a consistent shooter? That can hold you back. Being a streaky shooter versus being a consistent shooter can make can change the difference in your career trajectory. And so these are things when you come here, you know, we'll work on those things. We want to be more consistent at shooting. And then the next thing is just like being able to play in different paces and different systems, being able to adapt. Like some kids at around this age, they play one speed. Mm. It's hard, especially for that kid who's athletic, quick, and twitchy, to slow down. Like maybe you going slower might be more effective today versus you trying to go 100 miles per hour. And so for me, like we, I want to watch a lot of film with our guys so they can see these things and the differences um, because sometimes it's literally just getting that little component, like slow down, like play with pace. You know, don't play at one speed, change your speeds. That can be something that can um, change you. But I do think like the main thing that you hard your hat on is like defense. I don't think a lot of kids, we live in the highlight era. Yeah. Yes, there are some extreme people who can really score. But 
at the next level, the division one level, you can't score 20 and then give up 30. It doesn't help the team win. So that's where I know at my, and I'll give a shout out to South Kent. We spend so much time on defense that guys, when they go to college, they're ready to play right away because they're ready and sound defensively. And that sticks out to some schools. Like I know Fairfield, they offered one of our guys. He was a good shooter, but he got that little bit of hump because of what we did defensively. And so kids buying into that piece too, like just buying into like, you know, at the next level, what you're striving for, you want to play division one, you want to be on scholarship. Are you guarding like a division one player? There was like some kids just don't like that. Like, but is that, are you really guarding at a level that translates? Love and you know, no one's sending you video of them being in the help side. <laughs> and I don't think coaches want to see that either. But when they go see you in the summer, they do want to see that. Love it. And Thanks for sharing that. Yep. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Uh, now, you went from UConn to work for the Trailblazers. Um, what did you see there in your day-to-day life that now everyone wants to get to the NBA from D1? What did you see there that was different um, versus the D1 level? No, nah, like I said, like that was like crazy. Um, for one, like, you know, going to the right place that shows your skill set is important. So obviously, you know, Portland had two really good guards, CJ McCollum and of course, Damian Lewis. And they both came from smaller schools. Them choosing those schools were the right fit for them. And I tell families the same thing. Like, it only takes one school to believe in you. Like, obviously, Stephen Curry, we know his story he goes to Davidson. Um, so that's the first thing, like just going to the right fit can change everything for you. But then when you get away from those type of like super special players who transcend generations, um, pedigree means a lot at that level. So we had a second round pick. Um, don't want to say his name, but he went to UNC. And because he was all American and because he went to UNC, he was kind of put ahead of the stack on some other guys in the division one level, because at that stage, like you're working with an owner and the owner is usually a business owner. So Miss Allen, like she was a business owner. She, you know, she doesn't speak basketball language like we speak it, but she understands, Oh, he's an all American. Oh, he goes to a brand like UNC. That is an easier sale to the owner. So some you're dealing with a different, it's like the workforce, you know, like, Oh, he went to Harvard. Me have, me have a kid that goes to Salisbury that might be more qualified and might be a better fit than the kid that goes to Harvard. But he went to Harvard, such and such, wrote his letter of recommendation. So we're gonna probably going to make this higher. And so that kind of happens a lot in the NBA. Um, Interesting. And then the next thing, like the NBA, you're talking about extreme level of professionalism. So either your talent is super, super, super like worth the money that you're getting or you're a, a professional, like you approach things differently. And so your desk is made, your locker is made, your how you interact with everyone in the office. You now I see people who are ultra professionals stick around in the NBA because they have that component to them. Like one of the people that I really, really looked up to was Steve Blake. He was out there when I was out there and just the way he handles himself and it's just on like you can't speak like it's literally something you just have to observe like he is an ultra professional whenever he's inside that building like he is talking to everyone he's making his presence felt in his own way you know he's not a loud guy mm-hmm. but you feel him there and so those are little things that like i think separate you at that level but at the end of the day when you get there it's a business and that's what you got to get one of the things that i learned from my supervisor because I came from coaching and it was hard for me to grasp, but because when you're a coach, you're in the, you're in the, you know, you're in a war with them. Eli, you have to start looking at these guys as labor. Mm. Crazy. Different, different mindset. Like it was, it was hard. I got what he was trying to say, but it was just like, that's not what I'm in this for, but that is what it is. Like, and and rightfully so. Like you're getting paid a substantial amount of money for your talent. You're an independent contractor. 
understand that this is why you're here. You know, don't, you know, a lot of kids lose sight. They want to, you're in a different age, you know, you want to be in fashion. They want to be in all these different things. The thing that got you here is your body and the fact that you can perform at a higher rate than everybody else in the world. There's 450 of you. And don't forget that that is why you're here. You are here to perform at a high level on a consistent basis. Yeah, it's, uh, and, and what you said about Harvard and UNC, right? I like that you said that because those will get you initial interviews or initial hirings, right? That's fine. But if the kid from Salisbury, right, outperforms the guy that he got hired with from Harvard, the Salisbury guy is going to get promoted. Yes. So it doesn't matter. Once you get hired after that in the workforce, in most places where nepotism is not present, you know, you will get, you will get hired or you'll get a big contract in the NBA based on your performance, not if you were an all American or not where you came from specifically. So it's only about a foot in the door. And that's where, once again, we use that with families talking about the right fit, you know? Yeah. I know you want Harvard. I know you want Ivy. That's great. Right. Awesome. But if you go to a better fitting school, have a four year good experience, and then you outperform that guy from Harvard, right. In the workforce, you're going to be fine. In fact, you're going to be better than that guy. 100%. Um, So I'm glad you keep mentioning that, that it's, it's yeah. Okay. Um, You then went from Portland to the prep school world to work yeah. for your, you know, Chilius, uh, who's a friend of the program um, in the prep school world. So you've done Juco, you've done D3, you've done low major, high major, MBA, all you're missing, Eli, is D2 and international. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I'm not counting you out to, to get those on your resume before you're done. <laughs> but talk to me now about going from these different places to such a high level prep school like South Kent under a high Highly motivational, highly skilled, great recruiter, and Coach Raphael Chilius. Tell me about that experience at South Kent and what you'd like to um, Well, one, I give a lot of credit to Chills. Um, he was at UConn when I was at UConn. Um, so our relationship was built there. He also recruited – I did some AAU as well. He also recruited Markel Fultz to Washington, and I was with the same AAU program. And so that was like our first initial connection. Um, he recruited me – like right after Portland, hey, you need to come do this. And it was during COVID and I was terrified. Like I did not want to do it. I was like, I don't understand why you would leave. I didn't quite understand it. Um, When I showed up on campus and I saw the impact that he had for that school, that was the first thing that I saw. Like, man, like his impact for that school was just like, you cannot, you have to be there to see it. Like he is a leader there. He's probably the strongest leader there outside of the head of school. He is the strongest leader on that campus. Um, then the next thing, like seeing how he built it, you know, these are things that, you know, as a younger coach and I worked all the way in the NBA, I had a thought like, what do I do? What can I do to separate myself in the profession that I want to do? I want to do this for my living. Like, how do I separate myself? Well, Chills, he created South Kent basketball. Mm-hmm. Like it was not really, you know, now it's a nationally recognized thing, but it wasn't that way when he, when he first got there. And so these are little lessons that I get from him and how he created and how he made it a national brand and took it to where it is today. Um, I got to see that as he rebuilt it because he came back and he rebuilt the program and now they're rolling. You know, I got to see when we weren't necessarily nationally recognized, when he's bringing the coaches in the gym and we don't necessarily have high major players in the gym. Um, I got to see like the growth from there. And so those are the things that like really sparked my interest because I knew that if I had an opportunity to do the same thing, you know, my kind of me like was like, hey, maybe if he leaves, I'll be at South Kent, you know, like I'll be able to continue tradition. That didn't occur, but I knew when I got my next opportunity, I knew the recipe and how to be successful. He laid the he laid the blueprint for me, like like very easy to follow. And he gave also gave me a lot of like autonomy, like he trusted me that I could, you know, do certain things for the team. And I I never was in that position either at the other places I were at. I was at I was always, you know, a support staff. The one of the things he used to recruit me is like, you're going to coach here, Eli, like you're going to be a coach. I'm going to need you to be on the floor and I'm going to need you to take care of the guys and everything that he said. I I did at South Kent and what it did was prepare me to, and I'll go back one more, my back, one more thing. When I was in the NBA, I saw that 
places like South Camp, Brewster, Mount Verde, I saw that they weren't that far away from the NBA <laughs> that like, versus when I was at Corpus Christi, I'm a lot further than the NBA than, and I didn't know that, but that's not said. So when I got to South Canada and like, I started to see like, okay, like, you know, last year we had a really good group. You know, we're not that far off from getting a phone call from somebody who works at one of the organizations. Yeah. And so that to me was really intriguing as well. Like I was excited about that opportunity to be not that far away from where I just came from. Um, and so that, those, those are the things that like South Camp really like prepared me for. And then the next thing, that one thing that you said, that kid that comes in that has division three, we had a kid, Jack McClinton, who played for chills years and years ago. He came and spoke to our team. He was exactly that kid. He was a division three kid recruited. He was not going to go division one. He goes to South camp for a year and he goes crazy in the gym. He just stays in the gym. He does what he's supposed to do in class. He meets everyone on campus. Like he's a very business savvy guy. He's, he's phenomenal. And this kid leaves and he goes to division one. He finishes his career at Miami. That foundation was because one coach believed in him and gave him an opportunity and what he did with it. No one promised him anything. That's what I always yeah. say when I say, they didn't, but he took advantage of the opportunity. And that is the beautiful part about South Kent. We had another kid who I will give a shout out to because I love this kid, Nate Garangamba. He came to that school and he really took advantage of the model that we had at South Kent. And he worked himself into being a division one level player. And I think he always was going to end up at, at that level. But I know personally the work he put in and how he took advantage of the opportunity. And so every kid has that a uh, chance when they go to a boarding prep school to take advantage of the opportunity to just try to separate yourself from your peers. Yeah. And you mentioned um, that chills rebuilt South Kent first time into a national program then did it again a second time you see in that firsthand, what's the big thing that he does that might be unconventional that you're taking to incorporate at Andrews Osborne? Oh, uh, I think he gives you the division one experience right away. How so? Um, Chills is not going to hold back. Chills is going to coach you like you're already there. Um, mm. Chills is going to like, you're going to be in phenomenal shape. There's not like a, you, you can't avoid that. <laughs> you can't avoid that. Um, And that's division one too. You can't avoid that. You're going to be in phenomenal shape. Some things that kids just don't quite grasp. I want to play division one. Are you in shape like a division one player? Are you ready for one of those off seasons? So that's the first thing. We have an off season that is very similar to a division one uh, place. And then the next thing, like he coaches you hard. Like he coaches hard. He loves you. He gives you all the attention you need, but he also coaches you with that same level of competitiveness. And so you are going to be prepared to play for a college, like, because that is how it is. Some coaches are amazing at how they deliver and some coaches are not. <laughs> like, so that's the one thing, like for him, he's going to coach you very similar to what it feels like at the division one level. And then the last piece is just like a separator for him. He's been there before. Yeah. That's something that, you know, for me, I'm, I've been there, but I haven't been there at the level that he's been there. And so for me, you know, I'm still growing in that avenue. I think my journey is going to be different, but it's always easier to trust in someone who's already done it. He's done it with several players um, from his first stint to this stint. And so those are things that you can hang your hat on when you go play for him. And these are things that I'm incorporating here because as you said, like I have the knowledge of what it looks like. I have the relationships. Um, now it's about us delivering. Now it's about us. I really mean this when every kid that comes in my program, I want them to be ready to play college basketball in general. Yeah. So if you go to division three, I want you to make an impact at your division three. If you go division one, I, I want you to make an impact at your division one. And that is my goal as I start this program here is that every kid I get makes an impact. It doesn't have to always be statistical, but they make an impact. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Eli, we're going to get in some quick hitters right now, okay? All right. Who's the best player you ever played against? Kevin Durant. Mm. 
played against was, play against go ahead yeah well i was gonna say what year was he at national christian with you like how old was he 10th grade 9th 10th grade how good was i he wouldn't there? say okay that I, I wasn't playing against him playing against like opposite school chris wright oh uh, yeah chris wright at st john's best player ever played against yeah. I, I can never deny that john wall's up there but chris wright is the one where i used to like lose sleep over yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, who's the best player you ever coached against first at the d1 level whether it was at corpus christi or yukon and then we'll go to prep school when you're at south kent Mm, Jaron Jackson and Miles Bridges, mm. they were different. And I never, I have a great story about, we were, we were in a tough game with them at a PK 80. We were f- fighting them the whole second half. And he turned to the bench and was like, all right. He said something, he, you know, he said something in different yeah. language. Like we probably shouldn't have said it. But when he said that his team responded and it was just like, wow like just the level of play that they took it to. And we, you know, Jaron Jackson was a freshman. I didn't even know who he was. I, I'm sorry that I didn't, I didn't even know who he was. I was not aware. And I just wasn't locked in on that, you know, and the rivals rankings and stuff at that moment. I was locked in in my video working. Man, this kid was an NBA player at the moment. I saw him, I was like, oh, who is this? And so <laughs> those two, like right away, Cam Reddish, he was really good in high school um hunter hunter big hunter who's at kansas now from michigan he was also hunter dickerson was really really good uh those are people i coached against how about south kent though uh i guess that brewster team we played against is you know they had a lot of talent they had a lot of talent oh yeah putnam science and so i want to say collectives on that thing because i don't want to shout out just one player okay yeah, Putnam and Brewster, they had a lot of that, that. We coached against Putnam that year when they went undefeated. I'll give one card, Barry. I for, Barry, I forget his last name. Barry was really, really good. Arturio Dean was really, really good. Desmond Claude was really, really good. They were really good players. Brewster, solo ball was really, really good. Um, yeah. Lou Descharm, really, really good. Um, Taylor Bowen, phenomenal athlete, ton of potential. The, it, those are really good teams. They were really what's, your, good. what's your favorite movie? Favorite movie? Man, that's a tough one. Or a couple. He got game. Um, I love Finding Nemo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he got game, Finding Nemo, and then I would pick one more. It's probably casino oh yeah yeah i really like casino i really like i really like those style style of movies i I don't know why i just i know they're always in the same way but i just like them they they're very entertaining to me i'm more of a show guy than a movie guy though i will say that i'm more of a i like series i don't like movies it's hard for me to the story be over in two hours i'm like no there's more to the story once you have kids that uh, those series days will be limited so you'll be very selective on what you want to spend 28 hours on so true (laughs) all right hey um anything we didn't talk about today you want to mention or touch on um no we all talked about it but i'll reiterate it again like choose a school based on the coach choose a school based on the fit um we always look at these stories of Stephen Curry and Damian Lillard, and there's so many people out there who did not go to the school that, you know, everyone knows, but they went to the place that fit them. And I think a lot of kids need to understand that. They need to understand that go to a place where, you know, you're going to be loved on and that person believes in you. Um, and I think when you do that, you have a better experience and you actually are more likely to be successful than if you go someplace and you're chasing it. So I always try to tell kids that like, man, just go. Like, even when it comes to AAU, some kids, they all want to do circuit. Oh, I want to play for the UIBL. Oh, I want to play Adidas. Oh, I want to do this. Oh, that's great. But, you know, I know a kid, another kid I should have shout out, Rowan. Rowan, I always butcher his last name. Rowan, who's going to Georgetown, was at Northfield Mount Hermon from the D.C. area. Run by yeah. Owen, yes. Really good player. Did not play circuit level AAU. 
play independent AAU, still went to, you know, was recruited by Northwestern, Texas, all these different places, but he went to a place that fit him. Yeah. And that is another story. And I think one day he's going to be able to have a chance to be in the NBA um, because he, he gets that piece. He's not chasing the, the glitz and glamour. He's chasing the right fit. Yeah. And so I think that that's the, how you should approach this. People want to find you and reach out to you. What's the best way they should do it? Uh, through my Twitter, okay. Coach Eli Gore, or definitely email um, Eli Gore at andrewosborne.com. Osborne without a U. A lot Which I've made that mistake, so I would never make it again. <laughs> You're not the only one. We had somebody <laughs> put that on their commitment, uh, their commitment graphic, and I was like, hey, there's no uh. U. But there's nothing wrong with that. We, we're going to, obviously, people are going to learn. Um that and then obviously through sale, but I don't give that out to everyone. So I'm gonna go crazy. Yeah. But um, my our website, you know, we have uh anchory that you just go to boys basketball, boys prep basketball, and Andrew Osborne. Um, I'll definitely be able to get your anchory from that. And I'll put all these contacts in the show notes down below for people to uh, reach out to you directly. But Eli, thanks so much for um coming on the podcast today and sharing about a school that probably a lot of people don't know about yet, but with you and the new leadership there um, and already the, the activity you've been doing over the past few months working with me has just been very impressive. And so I'm excited to see what you're going to do there. Appreciate your help. And uh, man, thanks for sharing these stories today. Cause I think it's so valuable. You know, Juco D three low major, high major MBA prep school, starting a dynasty at your new situation. I think you gave such a good overview of all these different levels that I think that's going to be valuable when you talk to families because you can say, no, I've been there. I know what this is like. And no, I've been there too. I know what this is like. And then having your father-in-law be the head coach at MIT, just it's, you got a great story. I think a lot of families are going to connect to it. And I really just appreciate you sharing that with us today. Thanks for having me. Man. I really appreciate it. And you've been phenomenal with, with me. You've, you've been a resource and somebody that I can rely on too. So I just want to give you some credit. You do an amazing job. I want to shout that out. If you're using anyone as a consultant, you need to use prep athletics. I do say that to individual families. I always say that like, Hey, you know, I really trust Corey. And so, because you get it, you know, I don't want to shoot anyone down, but we talk about this. That's why one thing I want to shout out Rick and mortar schools, like go to, yeah. a school, you know, like go to a school where the, academics and the athletics and they're all under one house they're all working in unison that's going to be more beneficial than chasing a place that's promising just basketball in some ways because you lose real life like that's not real life so you're excellent with that of selecting those schools thanks and there are good academies out there doing it the right way I want to say that, um, but I've had horrible experiences with quite a few, more than I would have liked back in the day. And um, to any families that can't afford the brick and mortar option or looking at academies, just do your due diligence. And even then, just know, just like Kanye, even though you might have a billionaire funder, a couple comments here and there from one person can shut a whole place down. So just, yeah. just going with open eyes too. But reach out to me always or guys like Eli. We'll at least point you in the right direction and try to help you out. So, well, thanks so much for joining. If you guys like this, be sure to subscribe on all the major podcasting platforms. Really, I'd like you to subscribe uh, to the YouTube page. Just we got a lot of good information on there. You can see our pretty faces versus just hearing our voice. And um, until next time, we'll see you soon. So take care.